Okay, are we ready? Good evening, I'm Susan Bailey, Executive Director of 108 Contemporary, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual artist talk with Jonathan Hills, whose exhibition Facets opened at the gallery on February 6th and will continue through March 21st. Given the current weather in Oklahoma, we're very glad that tonight's talk is virtual so that everyone can listen safely from the comfort of their, comfort of their home. So please take a moment to say hello and tell us where you're Zooming from tonight uh, in the chat feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Also, we will have a question and answer period following Jonathan's talk. So please leave any questions you have for him in the chat and they can be addressed at that time. But before I turn things over to Jonathan, I would like to thank everyone who's made this exhibition possible. Facets is sponsored by the Mervyn Bovaird Foundation with additional support from the Kathleen Patton Westby Foundation. And we are extremely grateful for their support. Thanks also to the 108 Contemporary Board of Directors for their belief in the organization's mission to support Oklahoma's contemporary craft artists. And I can never say enough good things about the 108 Contemporary staff who make amazing things happen in the gallery. Thanks to exhibition director, Jen Boyd Martin, community engagement manager, Laura Ryan, communications coordinator, Tessa Copeland, graphic designers, Han Din and Naomi Dunn, and videographer, Jack Dean, for all their work to bring this exhibition to Tulsa. And of course, a huge shout out to Jonathan Hills for creating beautiful new work for this exhibition in spite of a pandemic and installing it in the gallery with the assistance of his wife, Jackie Hills and University of Oklahoma students, Alex McSpadden and Maggie Ashbaker. Jonathan Hills is a sculpture professor at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. His research interests include digital fabrication, CAD, 3D printing, and public art. Jonathan has exhibited across the country and is represented in private and corporate collections internationally. He has completed public art projects for the City of Norman, the San Diego Port Authority, the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority, and the Paseo Arts Association in Oklahoma City. He has a number of upcoming projects that include permanent public sculptures for the City of Oklahoma City and the City of Cerritos, California. We are honored to have his work on display at 108 Contemporary. And now please welcome Jonathan Hills, who is joining us from his home in Norman. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, I'd like to echo uh, all of my thanks to everybody at 108 Contemporary for um, allowing me to have this opportunity and to uh, making this process as seamless as possible, given all of the ups and downs of everything we've all had to go through uh, over the past month. So I'm just glad that uh, the work um, managed to be realized and we do have a show. So uh, small victories. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump right into uh, my presentation. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the screen sharing and we will get underway. So um, as Susan mentioned, I'm an educator, uh, I'm a researcher, I'm an artist. Um, my interests vary greatly across many different uh, aspects of the creative process. Uh, it involves language, it involves technology, uh, it involves crafts, it involves uh, manual labor, digital labor, uh, and um, I'm going to try to give you sort of a brief snapshot for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the majority of my work. Uh, what I've done in the past that has led to sort of this new work, uh, new way of working, new body of work uh, over the past few years that has really uh, enlivened uh, sort of my creative uh, output and uh, delivered uh, sort of new ways to kind of express uh, all of my interests uh, and um, I'm constantly learning uh, in that process. So um, the name of the show is Facets and I like language a lot. So uh, I like to use words to help uh, sort of ground a lot of the ideas uh, that revolve around my work. And I don't necessarily want to present a very dry academic research based uh, lecture tonight, but uh, I do have an awful lot of uh, 
information and sort of places that I like to pull information from. So um, when we think of a word in particular, I chose facets because it, it kind of represents a lot of our technological digital lives. Um, we know facets generally uh, from sort of gem cutting, um, but facets also sort of connect us to trajectory, to different kinds of systems, surfaces, facades, faces. And in particular, I want to pay attention very much to the two words at the bottom of the screen, translations and augmentation. Um, these are going to be brought up throughout my talk. And um, hopefully, the information that I'll be providing to you, um, just keep in mind that a lot of what I'm discussing involves this idea of translating and augmenting not only experiences that we are creating for ourselves, but that um, other external influences are constantly sort of feeding into our ability to translate and continually to augment. And that's kind of the way that I think about running um, my creative process these days. <clears throat> and the idea of drawing is a big part of uh, what I've done throughout my entire history as a creative individual. And I say this with the uh, caveat that I generally do not draw uh, pencil to paper at all. I don't, I'm not a drafts person. I don't draw in the traditional artistic sense. Um, drawing for me is thinking. It is an intellectual pursuit. It's a way to connect uh, language to sort of actions to uh, residue of objects and or creative acts that come out of uh, a thinking process. But I also draw in space. Everything that I do generally tends to be a drawing, uh, but I don't necessarily work in that traditional sense of, of pencil to paper. So if we look at sort of all the possible <clears throat> definitions or ideas about what it is to draw, this is kind of an amazing word. And I like to use this, especially when I'm talking to students about not just drawing objects and representation and kind of figuring out and understanding the world around you so that you can sort of capture some essence of how we perceive, um, but drawing is also an intellectual pursuit. And it has a lot to do with how we develop, how we formulate, how we exert physical actions, but again, how we translate and how we augment our sort of developing reality uh, and, and understanding of ourselves. And uh, in my uh, uh, didactic on the wall at, at 108 Contemporary, I mentioned mowing the lawn, uh, which seems like a really weird place for a uh, uh, artist to uh, go to. But um, mowing the lawn was actually one of the first sort of really important creative acts that I can uh, recall um, as, a, as a child. Um, I was born in a very creative family, lots of artists, lots of artisans, craftsmen, um, people who were very involved in creative processes. And so that was always instilled in me in a part of, part of what I was always doing uh, as a child. And this is a, a picture of my house uh, that I grew up in, in uh, Keene, New Hampshire, uh, 644 Court Street. And it had a fairly sizable yard in the front and the back uh, and the side. Uh, and of course, there, there's a, always this time when a young boy has to sort of take on these, uh, you know, not so fun chores uh, that involve, you know, mowing the lawn. And, you know, when we think about something that is simple as an act of mowing um, within a perimeter, we have a lot of abilities to kind of figure out sort of where one starts this process of mowing the grass. Um, you know, where do you start? What kind of trajectory are you going to take through these sort of perimeters that are laid out for you with this sort of mission of working within a set, uh, a set parameter? And a uh, huge baseball fan when I was a child, uh, and I was always enthralled watching um, my uh, Boston Red Sox back in the uh, 70s when they weren't necessarily uh, all that great. Uh, watching on television and seeing patterns that were actually uh, mowed in the yard or mowed on the field uh, in these places. The image up to the, the left is a much more modern take on Fenway Park uh, with a very elaborate sort of graphic design, creative sort of 
uh, process that goes into a aesthetic experience that um, you know we take in and we see within the perimeters of the field. Uh, the the lower uh, right hand uh, image is a, a picture from 1967, uh, and you can faintly see this uh, attitude in the in the outfield where you see the lines of where the mower just kind of goes back and forth. Maybe not in necessarily a, a distinct uh, objective of making a graphic into the grass itself, um, but I was very drawn to this idea that I had this creative experience and I would actually take the time uh, to sort of see how I could change the pattern of mowing the, the lawn at my house uh, so that as people drove by, people could kind of see like a different pattern each week, like trying to sort of be a creative person within this uh, sort of social, uh, a social uh, uh, construct. Um, just for my own satisfaction, knowing that people at Drew of Pass could actually see uh, this sort of drawing that I was doing uh, with a simple lawnmower. Uh, other things that really influenced my work growing up uh, and experiences early on in my education, uh, spent a lot of time uh, in the North Georgia mountains, uh, had a lot of exposure to individuals making handmade lace, uh, people who would be working on uh, handmade quilts, uh, and having a really kind of distinct dialogue with individuals about sort of the processes of developing patterns, developing different systems and systematic ways of working with uh, smaller elements that sort of creates the whole uh, and working in a way that sort of defines this ability to begin in a spot and work your way out uh, and create uh, these sort of um, visual experiences through sort of a systemic or systemized uh, process. And in the, the idea of quilt making, you know, this process becomes very graphical and you have a lot of abilities to kind of play with geometry uh, and the lace making very much more of an organic kind of sensibility. So I was taking a lot of this information in uh, early on in my education. Uh, and then, um, you know, as I get into uh, college and we we're starting to get hit with sort of artistic theory and ideas from contemporary art. Um, Frank Stella's systemic painting particularly struck me as something that made a lot of sense to me uh, as a art maker. Um, this idea of sort of creating not necessarily just hard geometry, but this notion that you could take a system of a very regimented idea of mark making and painting uh, and try to kind of create a systemic sort of overview. And what's be beautiful about these paintings when you see them in person is particularly, um, there's a real confluence of sort of a lot of energy that goes into sort of the organic nature of the lines that are sort of delineated between these big black um, strokes of paint, uh, where he was very much trying to make very even, uh, very sort of regimented um, uh, structures, but the, the sense of the human hand and sort of the imperfections of that sort of ability to kind of almost be mechanized, or we could talk about maybe sort of industrialized through this repetition, um, is really very, very difficult to replicate just through the human hand. And the human hand comes into what we see as the residue of sort of an artistic practice like this. So what I'm best known for um, that I've uh, working particularly with metal uh, for most of my life, most of my creative career uh, was to take a lot of these ideas that drew from crafts, that drew from um, this idea of systems and organic systems, biological systems, and use a very, very intensive, labor intensive manner of working. Um, a lot of these pieces involve a lot of just uh, brutal uh, uh, cutting and bending by hand and welding very, very small pieces of metal together, uh, sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands individually pieces individual pieces of metal that have been bent. And then they kind of assemble and they create these larger experiences. And within these pieces, I had set up all kinds of rules and regulations about how pieces of uh, this metal could and could not interact with other pieces of metal. And these transitions and connections became sort of paramount in defining and creating these works. 
Um, I've always been interested in sort of playing with line, playing with light, um, moving spaces where sort of as you move or, around and past objects, that light and densities sort of open up, they shimmer, they close. Um, and this was a really big part of my working methodology for, for quite a long time. Uh, this is another piece uh, from 2012, some of the later work uh, when I started to sort of transition away from uh, some of this sort of laborious uh, uh, metalwork. Uh, and that work also translated into some recognizable ob objects. Um, so uh, I have done some, uh, some pieces that involve cars and vehicles, uh, in particular, if you've ever um, traversed the I-44 turnpike between Oklahoma City uh, uh, through Tulsa and then onward, uh, uh, upwards going towards uh, Springfield, Missouri, um, there's a Corvette sitting in the uh, famous uh, overpass there. Um, and so I would shift and move this ideology into many different places, but it, it, it is fundamental uh, basis. I'm very much an abstract artist in many, many ways. Um, so this leads me to uh, 2010, um, where I had a solo exhibition at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art uh, that involved nothing but vehicles uh, using pickup trucks, race cars, muscle cars, um, different types of uh, sort of iconic uh, American uh, imagery uh, that I would use to sort of play with some ideas of politics, uh, in this case, <clears throat> uh, issues that revolved around the uh, Iraq war. Uh, and this is the first time I actually used uh, any sort of digital technology in any of the works. And this was a very rudimentary, simple uh, system of taking Google map images uh, running it through a vector software program, tracing out uh, individual cities and locations that all had a relationship to um, what influenced and would influence sort of the, the totality of, of the Iraq war uh, and its implications uh, thereof. So um, this is sort of an abstracted pickup truck sarcophagus sort of dumped on its side and it's illuminated from the interior uh, specifically to illuminate and to dim certain areas across the globe in different cities depending upon uh, their sort of interactions within that conflict. Uh, that led me into some really um, sort of looking at the way the residue of these map images and this vector tracing and how software is sort of just an approximation. It was an augmentation of, of something that was coming from a digital source. The digital source then creates essentially a new version of a digital asset from that information. Um, and the more I looked at these map images, I got really into sort of looking at microscope images, looking at different ways that mathematics, uh, coding, uh, different ways even in biological systems like dragon wings, lily pads, had these sort of beautiful, amazing sensibilities of structure and organization that become these sort of self-organizing systems. Uh, again, using words down in the lower right-hand corner, you know, talking about biocomputational forms, systemic forms, emergent structural systems. These all come out of both sort of a natural, but also sort of a mathematical and a digital component that um, we see quite often now at work. And if we sort of extrapolate a lot of these systems, particularly in the way that we are sort of being influenced today through social media uh, and the methods of sort of consumerism, um, all of these systems I'm talking about um, have been adapted by a lot of tech firms, a lot of these uh, structures that are trying to get us to uh, purchase, are trying to drive our uh, politics, they are trying to anticipate what we are going to buy, what we're going to like, uh, etc. Um, so a lot of this gets very dense, and I don't want to get into a, a long sort of academic discussion about where all this can go and how we can kind of look at these systems, but uh, I just want to kind of re reiterate that, you know, my work um, very much comes from this idea of finding linear uh, systems that I can use and translate uh, into some of the new work and the ways that I think about using digital technology in particular. 
2012, I did a very small public art piece here in Norman. Uh, this was the second uh, artwork uh, that I used uh, completely all digital CNC technology on, uh, in this case, uh, using water jet CNC technology to cut out uh, what I took was an overlay of the, of the city of Norman uh, and created something that's called the Voronoi uh, diagram by using different intersections and landmarks that I could plot out uh, within the, the framework of the city's map. Uh, and then using some simple software, it basically connects all of these points and generates a system of their connectivity. Uh, and then I kind of just sort of took took that map and sort of folded it on itself into what I called silver lining, which is sort of a, a cloud that's sort of tipped on its side, uh, playing with the, the idea of sort of how we, we read and see clouds up in the sky. I wanted to take a cloud and actually flip it uh, and, and make it something vertical and then allow the lines and these densities to sort of become part of the experience that's connected very specifically to uh, the site that it was located in Norman. Uh, other works uh, spawned out of that that go into digital technologies, uh, public artworks. I've done several public artworks across uh, the country um, and in Oklahoma City especially. Uh, and this was my first real involvement with using CAD modeling. Uh, and you know, quite frankly, to be open with everybody, if, if anybody had met me back in, let's say, the early 2000s and said, hey, uh, you, know, you should be working digitally, I probably would have uh, completely uh, 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 dismissed anything you had to tell me about digital technology. Uh, some interesting things happen as you get older, and uh, not only does, do you, does your mind need new ways of expressing expressing itself and, and figuring out how to create, um, but your body also starts to have some issues where um, you know issues revolved around a lot of that intensive laborious work with my hands became very very difficult and. Um, I still do some of it today, but um, working through the computer, I had to adjust and start thinking about different ways to take uh, sort of ideas that were in my head, get them into a three dimensional computer. Uh, uh, landscape and then sort of figure out how to output that to create an actual object. This is uh, the work that's in the Paseo Arts District uh, called Flamenco uh, that I completed in 2015. And this was sort of the really first large scale uh, work that was completely designed on a computer uh, and then completely output through CNC laser cutting technology with the steel. Uh, and then a manual process that involved actually uh, welding the whole thing uh, together. Uh, other ideas that I was playing around with at this time uh, involved the laser cutter or laser cutting technologies uh, as a drawing medium where uh, many of you have probably had a lot of exposure to uh, laser etching and, and different types of laser imagery or lasered uh, um, objects. Uh, and I wanted to take the idea of how a digital technology like a laser cutter could sort of um, impart a little bit more of its own will into a material. So this is uh, Ether from 2015. Uh, and what you're looking at is essentially um, wooden panels that have been painted a very, very dark blue color. And then I cast a very thin layer of um, synthetic beeswax uh, over the top of the panels uh, so that um, you get this sort of very airy kind of cloud-like um, um, uh, aesthetic on the panels. Uh, and then I used uh, some digital assets that I created uh, again, using sort of the idea of a Voronoi uh, diagram and then sort of altering that into a specific shape. Um, the laser actually melts the wax, so it's not cutting through anything. The heat of the laser, which is how a laser imparts its will on anything, is through heat, um, actually melts the wax and the residue of that process becomes a drawing so that um, the differences of sort of the way that the, the wax was melted and then um, again solidified leaves this beautiful residue of these um, digital lines. Um, and you know, if we go back to this really quickly, um, I use digital technology to develop a lot of these sort of visuals uh, primarily because um, I don't know that I have the patience 
to sit and draw something like this in particular. Um, but I can also play with software to get a whole number of different outputs so that um, I can sort of see a lot of different results and make decisions about how the computer and the software and all the different elements built into commands and menus and selections that I can make um, impart completely new, new visuals. And so um, it lets you rapidly visualize a lot of, a lot of possibilities very quickly. Uh, and that is something I've, I've really enjoyed about delving into uh, these technologies. Uh, another thing that I've developed very specifically, um, I could do a whole nother academic lecture on 3D printing and the aesthetics of 3D printing. Um, but I'll just sort of give you a, a brief overview of sort of how I look at 3D printing. Many of you have probably experienced this uh, process, um, you know, maybe seeing on the internet people uh, printing Mandalorian masks. Uh, at one point, Baby Groot was a very, very popular 3D printed asset all across the world. Uh, and people are involved with 3D printing um, in both sort of a professional and hobbyist uh, sort of motivations um, to make very specific objects many times. They're trying to replicate, they're trying to find uh, files and different things to make uh, replicas of something else, uh, particularly through pop culture, et cetera. Um, I was always drawn to 3D printing mostly because there is a, uh, uh, a conversation that happens between the creator who's dealing with digital design through the software, through the slicing software, and even through the printer itself, that all these sort of aspects of the creative process, just to wind up with a little piece of plastic, um, there's, a, there's a lot of attitude that goes into that. And there's a lot of creative aspects of how software is trying to translate an idea into a physical form. Um, so uh, if you can, if hopefully it's clear enough on the, on the webinar here to see that um, if you look in the upper left hand corner, this sort of disc shape that's been carved out of these blocks, um, you'll see a residue that looks very much like tree rings um, coming through a, a cut um, tree. And that is sort of digital technology trying to replicate something organic within a set paradigm of sort of rules and regulations about how this technology has to reproduce something. So again, going back to translations, going back to augmentations, this is something that when I started building this piece and I started to see how the software had its own logic, I just kind of in, embraced it and let that become part of uh, the visual experience. So this is a piece called Extrude from 2015. Uh, other works that I was exp uh, exploring at the time, um, this piece is called Kanye Logic, um, using the 3D printing technology as a drawing, again, looking at how I can make decisions about orientation of where the, the object resides within the 3D printing printer space, how I can manipulate and augment the interior uh, 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 building process, which we call infill, uh, and also letting this sort of infill be part of our experience. So if you're looking at sort of the gray and the blue uh, areas of this piece, you'll see sort of these open linear expressions. And that is, that's what's commonly termed infill in 3D printing, because we, we never really 3D print anything solid if we, we really don't have to. Um, so the idea of the technology has to replicate something I've designed. I have the power to, to manipulate how it will impart these expressions of both interior and exterior within the process itself. And um, it's a very much a layered process that also involves this idea of faceted geometry. So everything that we work with in this particular technology of 3D printing, um, we design within a 3D uh, CAD modeling space, and it can look incredibly fluid, incredibly smooth, but the translation to get it into physical form has to go through sort of this mathematical computation to find different points to create flat surfaces of geometry. So even in some of the most smooth 3D printed objects that I can produce at the root of it, there will always be this idea that it was built on sort of this polygonal or uh, mesh-based um, sort of 
uh, geometry, and that's how numbers and particularly um, computations can find these spaces uh, and find the object in space. And so um, I was very drawn to this idea. If we think about some of the metal work I showed earlier, um, a lot of this made perfect sense to me and the way that I had been building metal pieces it just flowed right into the way that these digital technologies are also trying to create objects and, and at least translate objects into sort of physical manifestations. So these are some photographs of just some of that, that idea of sort of how um, the 3D printing process, um, you know, I can manipulate where this object resides, the direction of these lines. I can influence how big, how small. So one thing, you know, I'd like to, you know, mention, you know, when I people talk about digital technology and we often, you know, immediately think about, well, well, it makes life, everything seems to be simple. And it just seems like uh, there's no creativity and there's nothing about sort of this process that talks about the hand. Um, I would argue that the, the hand and the mind are, are implicitly uh, sort of engaged in how you are dealing and wrestling with software that has certain biases and certain limitations uh, and trying to exploit it to create something dynamic, trying to create something uh, visual, but also has a connection to the whole history of drawing, has a whole connection to the history of painting. Um, and, you know, I'm a big proponent, particularly of the work uh, that David Byrne, the uh, musician and uh, artist, uh, musician from the Talking Heads, uh, artist in the early 2000s did an entire art artwork uh, or body of work based off of using uh, PowerPoint from the early 2000s, where he simply used the tools and the, the ability of the soft, the limitations of the software, and tried to exploit that into something that was sort of creative. And I've of, often thought about that in the way that um, these particular types of software will allow me uh, the same kind of uh, experience. So um, there's a lot more than just printing a, printing a shape in the plastic. Um, there's a lot of thought, a lot of residue about what kind of uh, influence and forms I'm trying to achieve. So these are some close-ups um, of some 3D printed translucent blue uh, plastic uh, units that I was experimenting with, where I can both sort of make the interior and the exterior of these objects visible in a sense at the same time. So the interior infill on the right, this sort of crisscrossing uh, pattern is, is basically behind a facade. It's on the inside of a layer of solid plastic, but I can make it bleed through uh, so that your experience uh, shifts between both the exterior and the interior constantly. Uh, and, you know, that's something else if we go back to thinking about my metal work, I was always interested in how you can sort of capture volume and empty space through a facade that you can completely see through uh, at the same time and you can kind of experience uh, all, all aspects of a three-dimensional object. Um, not, as, not as easy to do uh, in 3D printing, but there's still some crossover there in the way that I think about the 3D printing process uh, uh, and how I want to sort of have the visuals and the experience of the viewer. So this is another piece uh, from 2018, uh, Deep Recesses, which again uh, shows you how I can sort of collage. Uh, it's almost like a quilting process. Uh, I can use a lot of the technolo technological tools that are embedded in the software. Uh, and then I'm, I'm playing with these things. I'm trying to pull them out uh, and sort of create these um, particularly dynamic visuals. And this is also a, a point where I got very interested in, in dealing with color in a very specific way uh, so that um, Color was something I was always very, very timid about, very avoided quite often, and metalwork always gave me an out in that sense. Uh, everything was either silver, black, brown. Uh, there was not much of a palette uh, in, in working with that material. But when I started working with 3D printing, I very much started to become interested in not only color, uh, but also sort of sheen, reflectivity, using different types of plastic filaments that uh, are available on the market to sort of um, uh, specifically use to sort of 
uh, create very dense and, and very abstract sort of visuals. So uh, this is a piece that's in the show um, in, uh, at 108 um, called Record. Um, this uses a variety of different filaments in this sort of offset, off-kilter, abstract uh, sort of uh, design. Uh, and I'm very interested in also working with things that are both regimented and, and very haphazard. Uh, so that um, there's a lot of sense of regularity, but when you really kind of look at everything uh, in total, there's an awful lot of irregularity going on. Uh, and that's partly because of influences that I'm working with the technology uh, and the plastics. It's also the limitations of some of this um, digital technology that sometimes becomes incredibly imprecise and you can't control uh, specifically in ways that um, sometimes you would you would hope. So this is a close up of some of the elements in that in that work. So you know as we really kind of um, I'm interested in you know really the viewer uh, getting involved with looking at almost every single element, looking at how the different elements relate to each other, uh, and specifically seeing how lines are being maneuvered and and sort of adjusted throughout the piece uh, in very subtle ways, but also sometimes in very um, uh, very dynamic ways. Uh, this is another piece that's in the show called Earth Inverse from 2017. Uh, again, using this idea of how uh, these software and technology will sort of impart its will on this three-dimensional shape. Um, this is a piece that has a very specific uh, kind of identity uh, and meaning. Uh, Earth Inverse uh, relates to sort of, if we look at the bottom of the, of the sculpture, uh, moving from sort of this dense black unknown uh, sort of central core of the earth and then we start moving up into sort of uh, the the core of the earth that's sort of heated and we move up through the black uh, sort of strata and the rocks and the oil. Uh, we get into the earth, uh, we get into the sky, we start moving up into the clouds uh, and then we're eventually sort of trajecting back up into um, up into the, the, the uh, atmosphere and the galaxy. Uh, so that was sort of the motivation for using color um, and how this piece sort of uh, came together. Uh, this piece that's in the show called Torsion, again, represents sort of these ideas of uh, taking sort of the drawing process out of the 3D printed experience and then uh, using different materials. Uh, so some of these uh, materials produce very shiny effects, others produce sort of very matte effects. Uh, and then in some instances, you can also see the residue of how the interior and the exterior influence each other uh, as you sort of inspect all of the different elements coming together. Uh, this is a piece called Medusa that's in the show, um, very recent piece. Um, and this work, um, again, uh, very difficult for me to wrestle with uh, color and uh, really was trying to push myself to work with colors and uh, figure out sort of a, a, a system of bringing these together uh, that sort of challenged both myself and the viewer to sort of take in uh, the, the totality of this object. Uh, so this is, uh, and I should say for a lot of the pieces in the show, you'll see a lot of ovals and rings um, that's a that's a, a trope that's developed through these uh, this creative process recently, um, and a lot of that is associated to sort of like the the con continuity uh, connections. Um, you know this this idea of these elements not necessarily uh, being linear expressions anymore to create a whole, but generating sort of this more. Uh, holistic sort of connected identity uh, that all of these individual pieces are very much um, uh, uh, reliant on each other, I guess, for lack of a lack of a better word. Um, and to the right of this piece, you can see just one of the uh, one of the paint pieces being fabricated uh, on the 3D printer. Uh, again, that uh, layering process and the infill process, I can, I can manipulate the lines of both sort of the body uh, of the, of each element, but also this sort of 
snake-like serpentine line that is just sort of meandering uh, through the piece and it rises up and, and cascades down into uh, all of these elements as it, as it sort of again rolls around um, uh, this circular element. And you can kind of see the difference in the infill so that um, I have the ability again to sort of manipulate different parts of even within one piece, I can kind of change and adjust and uh, uh, manipulate um, these elements to my own, my own use. Uh, this piece, uh, Water Rose, um, this is uh, sort of reminiscent of some of the work that I've been doing and we'll, we'll see some of the work in the show uh, of accumulating again units and pieces that come together to form a larger whole. Uh, and a lot of the pieces in the show also have this, they're reliant on sort of um, these hardware connections, these sort of bolted connections um, that sort of start to try to piece together uh, all of these disparate parts into something that makes some type of uh, logical sense. Uh, so this is actually uh, a very complicated uh, object, both the design on a computer. Uh, it's also a very complicated piece to actually 3D print to be able to anticipate how all of these elements are going to relate to each other because the geometry that the 3D printer is printing um, has a lot of sort of uh, different angles and the way that the software has to figure out the best way to create these sort of topological um, elevations um, depend on the orientation of the, the object within the 3D printer. So um, I try to use that to my advantage and sort of develop this sort of uh, dynamic, linear, almost quilted sort of effect uh, on, on pieces such as this. Uh, and this will give you just kind of a little bit of an insight into sort of how this piece might look on the computer. Uh, so uh, on the left, we have the sort of the exterior framework uh, on the inside of this piece and many of the pieces that are upcoming. There's a really dense, very uh, intensively engineered system to kind of connect everything together. Um, a lot of these pieces involve not only um, you know, designing, but making sure that I know how everything will go together because I have to create in all of these small units. So I use numbering systems, the numbering systems translate into these connectors that are in the uh, colored in the magenta and the green uh, so that as I am uh, assembling, I can make sure that I can everything will go together. Uh, and everything in this that you're seeing on both the left and the right, all of this is 3D printed. So the connectors become 3D printed. Uh, and I'm using sort of very simple hardware strategies to embed um, sort of threaded, uh, threaded brass inserts to be able to receive uh, screws to put the whole thing together. Um, one of the pieces in the show is called Notre Dame. Uh, that is very much sort of inspired from the tragedy that we witnessed. Um, uh, all too recently. Uh, and one of the things that I was always struck by when, you know, people think of Notre Dame, they, they, they really think of the, the rose window. And I started to think about how all the photographs, if you do a Google search uh, for the rose window at Notre Dame, you're going to get um, tens and thousands and thousands of different images from different people um, who have a different experience in the way that they sort of see this uh, and, and, and how it, it, it exists. I was also, you know, uh, really drawn to sort of the, the graphical kind of layout, the very kind of hard design geometry. And so this gives everybody sort of a window into the way that I, I use and manipulate um, some of both photographs, digital assets that come from uh, the internet, things that I'm researching. So if we sort of translate from the, the photograph of uh, the rose window, um, I can run that image through very simple vector uh, drawing software um, with a few sliders and a few settings. I can get a myriad of sort of experiences that the computer is translating a digital image. It's a digital photograph of something that is, is actually physical. Um, and then I'm taking that and I'm trying to sort of create um, a new way to express or experience that object uh, through the way that the computer is trying to see it and try to render it out. And it, as you can see, it's an incredibly imprecise 
uh, complete, you know, sort of a complete mess on some sense. But you can also see that it's sort of created a creative process of its own to try to interpret. So we're talking again, translations, we're talking about augmentation. Uh, so this is a way that I sort of help generate linear uh, expression into uh, these pieces. Uh, so this is some working shots from the studio of the, uh, the sculpture going together. Um, I also started to use a spray paint technique um, and different painting techniques on clear acrylic. Uh, and then also will laser through different layers of paint so that um, I can create sort of these etchings that move through um, areas of paint. Um, and so this linear expression we just looked at uh, gets lasered into all of the individual elements uh, using 3D printed connectors uh, that sort of tie the whole uh, system together. And I really have to show you a close up of this because you know it's 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 almost impossible to shoot to to get the lines uh, really to show up um, on a photograph. But if you see the work in person um, in Tulsa, uh, it'll be much more apparent. Um, and so again, using color has been sort of a new experience for me using uh, painterly techniques. I have not painted for the better part of 25 years. Uh, just completely put down any sense of, of, uh, of painting at all once I got out of grad school and focused really just on creating sculptural objects. Uh, so I'm really kind of going back as well to sort of this idea of, of painting and using color. Uh, in, in new ways for me that have been both very uncomfortable, but also incredibly gratifying um, because uh, I'll talk about some of this process here in a moment where I, I actually don't know what the piece is gonna look like uh, specifically until uh, we unmask and peel all of the acrylic masking off of, off of the pieces. So um, I call a lot of this sort of digital archeological appropriation. Um, I scan the internet for different types of linear expressions that are pulled from science, pulled from mathematics, uh, pulled from graphic design, um, and you know, running them through the software uh, to try to generate um, interesting shapes, interesting forms that then influence the object and, and all of this comes from a myriad of different places. So uh, some of the recent pieces do have some references to uh, COVID-19 proteins that I actually took some of the digital images, ran them through again, these, these uh, vector technologies, uh, making alterations and playing with how the computer tried to mimic or augment uh, what we see as a digital image that comes just out of, out of sort of Google image proteins or Google image searches of uh, the COVID proteins. Uh, this is another example, uh, a piece that actually didn't get finished for the show, unfortunately, uh, that was taken of image from, from walking up uh, Mount Scott in the Wichita mountains. Um, and again, you can kind of see the photograph on the left. And this is just one of several translations that the uh, meager software is trying to uh, replicate through uh, just the means that are built into the software. So um, again, I can modulate this back and forth and I can play with density. Uh, I, can, I can have very big open linear expressions. I can kind of make very, very dense expressions where the software is trying to read the, the darks and the lights of this image uh, as, a, as a line drawing essentially. So that kind of thinking gets sort of uh, extrapolated and put into these three-dimensional geometric objects. Um, again, when we start talking about facets, a lot of the, the work in the show involves uh, using plexiglass, uh, using this systemic kind of idea of pieces and parts that have to kind of all assemble together uh, with this drawn or laser imparted sort of linear uh, drawings that kind of go through uh, these painted, um, this painted sort of process, uh, mostly on the back of the plexiglass. <clears throat> so when you look at most of the pieces in the show, um, everything that you're seeing actually exists um, on the back side of the plexiglass and is sort of moving its way uh, through to the front. Uh, this is the piece River Quilt in the show. Um, this was actually um, uh, uh, one of the uh, pieces where I was very much using this kind of free form spray painterly technique um, on the plexiglass and then again lasering through uh, sort of specific designs. This particular design came from a dried up uh, riverbed 
uh, and then running that image that you see up in the left through technology, rendered out at least a little clip of that became uh, that, that sort of scribbly linear aesthetic you can see there um, uh, in, the, in the frame of the layout of the pieces. So uh, all of the different structural pieces of the, of the, the sculpture itself uh, got to keep track of numbers, got to keep track of all the connections. Uh, and then I'm just sort of mapping this over it and then uh, bringing the entire, uh, all the objects, individual elements together. Uh, and then they all get bolted together in a very industrial uh, fashion. Emersford Roof uh, Rift. Um, this is actually using a Mondrian painting, uh, Mondrian's uh, uh, hometown, and uh, both sort of folding a Mondrian painting around this sculpture, but then I'm also adding uh, different elements that are sort of graphically similar to the painting uh, that are my own sort of uh, take. And so you can see some of those elements of the Mondrian lines, some of the colors, but then there are also individual elements in here that make absolutely no sense uh, in, the, in the scope of uh, a Mondrian painting. And this is really kind of an homage to you know, the idea of, of this sort of linear system and these really, really dense, beautiful sort of uh, graphical layouts of the way that he used line and space uh, that I really uh, was drawn to. Uh, this is a protein. Uh, this is a piece in the show. Um, and so this, this particular sculpture uh, is an 11-sided uh, 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 polygon um, using the number 11 um, gives me sort of this distinct way of, of managing, you know, could have been 13, could have been 15, but um, it gives me this ability to kind of manage how, um, no matter how, what orientation this object actually goes on the wall, um, there's nothing particularly symmetrical about it that you'll ever be able to kind of um, discern because of its, its geometry. Uh, and this is a really good example of a piece that I really didn't know exactly what it was going to look like uh, until we assembled all of the pieces together. And then we start peeling this brown masking, uh, those of you who are familiar with using acrylic, uh, that's a protective mask. Um, so a lot of this is also laying the pieces out. It is acting kind of like a painter to strategize over where I'm going to use different types of color, how I'm going to modulate this sort of powdery baby blue against the white, against the red. Uh, and these sort of systems come together and then there's kind of a big unveiling for me to be, be able to kind of discern um, what has actually occurred uh, in, the, in the piece itself. Uh, this uses a number of different protein uh, structures. Uh, from different um, different uh, scientific uh, uh, models, again, run through software, augmented to kind of create these very distinct sort of linear uh, drawings. Uh, Outback, it's in the uh, exhibition as well, um, uses uh, even some uh, uh, royalty-free clip art images. Uh, so there's actually quite an amazing amount of of uh, graphics that are out there on the internet that you know are, are free to use for various purposes. Uh, so this one has kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of a uh, organic, natural kind of feel to it. Uh, but there's also some heavily sort of modified uh, digital uh, data from scientific some scientific sort of resources that are kind of folded and overlaid into these just very sort of uh, uh, grand. And for me, these are these are very um, uh, you know, very kind of boisterous uh, works, uh, not something that I've, I've sort of known for, uh, but um, something that just seems to make sense in the, in the world that we're living in currently. Uh, and a lot of the work I'm really trying to create sort of bring together a lot of these disparate visual elements and the way that, you know, we, we traverse Instagram, we could traverse Facebook, we, we're using internet uh, images, we are constantly bombarded and, you know, we're, we're currently the human human race as it is right now is taking in more visual information than it ever has in, in the entire history of, of humanity. We are bombarded uh, constantly with all of this imagery. And so part of this is a, speaking to sort of that cacophony of just stuff that we're digesting, uh, but also trying to sort of bring it back out into this visual aesthetic um, that also has some sense of beauty and, and hopefully some sense of pleasure uh, as well. I'm very interested in aesthetics and I'm interested in craft. Um, so that's always going to be a big part of every, anything that I, that I do. 
uh, as an expression. So this would be a common image on my computer screen while I'm working on an object. I have all these sort of digital uh, assets that I've kind of traced and, and, and modulated. Uh, and then I'm going to, you know, cut some of these things up. I will, I will twist them. I will um, uh, sort of skew them. There's all sorts of different ways that I can manipulate this. And then it all just kind of gets overlaid on the panels. And then I have to make these decisions about color and where color is going to go. I never map out any of the color in these pieces. Um, this is much more of just sort of a feel of, of how I want a piece to sort of express itself. Um, you know, I've never used pink my entire life, my entire artistic career. Uh, I decided <clears throat> COVID was a great time to decide to do something that I would never, ever, ever do. Uh, and this is what came out, um, using pinks and, and baby blues and um, gold and, and different sort of elements that just sort of go and run themselves throughout the entire of the sculpture, um, both was just, uh, you know, I, I was uncomfortable uh, beyond belief while I was making this, just completely unsure of what was going to happen uh, and what the net residue would be, but it just sort of came together. So again, Outback, Carnival, you can make connections to our digital lives, the influence of all of this digital technology and how it's moving us and creating, uh, creating certain realities, breaking down certain realities um, and, and formulating what we're going to be doing and creating as our, our realities moving forward. Uh, so this would be a, 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 a little screenshot from that piece. Again, all the different digital assets, including a, a dragonfly wing, you can see down there in the lower left-hand corner uh, that go into sort of these expressions. Uh, what was, what is, what could be. Uh, this is actually a, a painterly technique uh, where I'm actually painting on the faces of the out exterior faces. So this does not exist on the interior of the plexiglass, but it actually exists uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the exterior. Uh, and because of I'm using this clear plexiglass and, and specific kind of spray paints, um, I get this really beautiful sort of luminous translucent sort of effect uh, with these uh, colors. Um, and this was a, a sort of a collaboration between my wife and I. Uh, she really wanted uh, uh, to see a, an artwork uh, with gold, red, and purple. Uh, she's really into sort of uh, royalty and the history of sort of royal families and sort of jewels and gems and different things. Um, so um, I sort of created this piece uh, in, in tandem with her uh, in terms of some of the aesthetics that went into uh, this particular uh, object. And this is a repeated form. So all of these sort of 11-sided um, objects that we're seeing, these are all a re repetitive form, but imparting different information uh, into each of these forms. And you can really see the three-dimensionality of the faceted uh, sort of uh, construct in this piece. Uh, speculation just uses all mirrors with a, a sort of cut line that's a, a glossy uh, black uh, acrylic, um, sort of mimicking this idea of sort of technological, industrial with this sort of organic uh, expression, the simple organic expression. Uh, and, you know, with this piece is very, very different from a lot of the works in the show, but this one is very much about um, you as a viewer having to sort of wrestle with um, finding a perspective to sort of see yourself or to see your surroundings within the object. Um, I've, there's been a, a number of artists who've used sort of this effect um, in the past, in past works. I like this idea that, um, you know, this work has to really be seen in person to really appreciate it and to really understand that, um, you know, the different views of yourself and the different ways that things are reflected back at you um, are sort of coming from different angles. It's not very straightforward. So there's a lot of, this is a very metaphorical work um, for me. Um, and so that's about all I wanna say about that. And if you get to a chance to experience in the, in the gallery, I hope you really um, take some time to kind of consider um, how you're reacting uh, and, and being reflected within uh, the object. Uh, Presentiment um, is actually a piece about my wife's phobias. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, she's horrified of snakes um, uh, and uh, using uh, some other, uh, some other more representational elements. So there you'll see some references to sort of razor blades uh, and, and sort of these snake elements um, along with sort of these very intricate dense 
uh, sort of graphic, linear graphics, but also sort of a feathery, kind of blue feathery um, uh, object that kind of floats in and out of the uh, sculpture itself. And that's kind of what the overlay of all the graphics I was working with to sort of uh, build into the actual panels of the sculpture. So everything kind of gets built in reverse. It's very much like a printmaking, uh, printmaking technology. Uh, and I'll finish up here with the, the one piece, um, the large piece uh, called Candyland that's in the, in the show uh, that was really sort of an experiment in uh, engineering, uh, having to figure out a very dense, difficult system uh, to create an object uh, that could exist off the wall. Uh, and so we have a lot of elements here, uh, 70 plus acrylic pieces, uh, well over a couple hundred 3D printed elements uh, and using CNC laser technologies, using a router, um, creating pieces and parts that all go together like a very, uh, very dense piece of Ikea furniture uh, to kind of build a subsystem uh, so all of this labor and this work designing on the computer, figuring out these little pieces of uh, plastic elements here on the right that will support and hold all of the different um, elements. But then I also have to deal with the sort of the graphics uh, and these, these expressions of color and line that I have to overlay over the whole system. Uh, and then all of this is done in reverse. So everything that I'm doing, I'm looking at in reverse and then the piece comes together um, as sort of a, a its final expression. So this is a, just a snippet of sort of the painting technology. So those of you who have used acrylic before, um, uh, you have essentially a mask that, that comes on the acrylic. I'm using a laser cutter to sort of etch through and draw into uh, the acrylic very lightly, but burning through that mask. Then I can start peeling individual elements, laying down a, a, a color, uh, and then peeling other elements and then laying color on top of that. And so some of these pieces might have seven or eight different um, colors that have to go into uh, just one panel to kind of make the whole, uh, the whole thing sort of come together. Uh, so again, a uh, big shout out to uh, my wife, Jackie, uh, who spent and helped endless, endless hours peeling uh, and painting areas of, of acrylic uh, till our, our nails were uh, practically bleeding and uh, sore fingers. It's this this part of it is incredibly laborious, uh, aside from all the work on the digital the digital side. And this is uh, kind of the behind the scenes of the structure of what you're going to see in the gallery. Uh, so this is uh, 72 inches by 72 inches. Uh, the the uh, frame itself weighs oh, probably roughly 65 70 pounds by itself, and then we're we're layering a 3 16 inch. Uh, acrylic um, on top of it. Uh, and so in this, this instance, uh, we started to peel the acrylic off first, uh, and then we started to build it and we could kind of see it come together. Uh, and this is the final expression of uh, the piece Candyland in the show. So uh, this is the first time I've done anything like this on a computer for an artist talk. Normally I, I do a lot of hand gestures, I make a lot of noises, I walk around a lot, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, didn't bore anybody too much. And I just again like to thank uh, Susan, Jennifer, and uh, Jean Ann especially uh, for all their hard work, all the all the, the people that work at 108. Uh, this was a just a really seamless, wonderful experience, uh, top to bottom. Uh, and I also have to uh, special thanks to the director of the OU School of Visual Art, Pete Frostley, uh, who did um, also help with some funding support um, for some of the works uh, in the show. All right, I think that's about all I have. If I can find my cursor, there we go. All right, and I'm back. All right, so um, if anybody has any questions, I guess we're doing it in the chat section. Um, there's so also there's, one in the Q&A section. There's one in the Q&A. Let me go to the Q&A really quickly. Um, so somebody asked about uh, graffiti. Yes, in a very you know non-serious way, um, I've, I've not studied graffiti art. I, 
would say, to be honest with you, uh, it's not something that I necessarily had much interest in, um, but certainly the way that I've started to develop work with both sort of spray paint and this graphic sort of expression now that has gotten away from uh, gotten away from um, uh, sort of the regimented linear work, yeah, has has sort of freed me up, and I'm, I'm really kind of enjoying how I can use color and spray paint. And it's very uncontrollable too. There's a lot that goes into that that becomes um, um, just sort of happenstance that I, I really, really enjoy. Ooh, what is my favorite piece and why? Ooh, um, oh, that one's gonna be hard. That, that one's very, very difficult to answer. I, I think um, really Candyland. Uh, because it really was, I think, the most uh, recent. Uh, it was the final piece that got finished for the show. Um, the labor that went into it, the things that I had to learn, uh, made a lot of mistakes while building that piece, had to redo a lot of sort of elements uh, and understanding sort of um, the, the engineering part of that is really fascinating to me. Uh, but I also just love the, the presence of it, everything from the polka dots to uh, the sort of fireworks sort of display that's in the center of the piece, um, just sort of gets me out of whatever this COVID thing was, this, this, the doldrums, this was sort of a time when I just decided, you know, the last thing the world needs is a rusty black uh, steel sculpture. Um, it just didn't seem to make any point to continue doing work like that anymore. And I really wanted to challenge myself. So that was, um, that was something uh, that I, I really, I think was important to me. Um, so uh, I have some research facilities at OU. So um, we have sort of large scale laser cutting and um, uh, CNC technologies. Um, I also use um, fabricators in and around Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So different individuals who have sort of different machines um, that uh, can, can help facilitate uh, doing some of this work uh, really helps me in, in doing this. And, you know, I teach digital fabrication. This is something that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, help students understand how to not just use this technology just for the sake of making an object because you can, but to let try to figure out how the, how the technology can also influence what the expression is. And you know, even when it comes to a CNC router in particular, um, you, can, you can give it sort of attitude and expression. If you know how to use the tools and you know how to program it and you know how to use the different tooling, you can actually create um, a lot of really amazing things that are impossible to do with the human hand. And I think that's one of the, the, the things that um, I really enjoy about it. Um, so somebody asked about using existing code, Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, um, you know, there's there's all kinds of ways that you can um, you can take code. You know, I'm not necessarily a coder. I'm not interested necessarily in all of the the, the behind the scenes of of how code is being used in the software, but certainly algorithms, code, and even in, in one software that I use, um, they tap into artificial intelligence. Um, it's not necessarily something that I'm particularly interested in, in knowing how to do myself, uh, because there are a lot of people out there uh, who, can, who can really do a much better job. And again, I'll go back to the idea of, of the David Byrne uh, using the PowerPoint art. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of using the tools in front of you and figuring out a really creative way to, to use it. You know, I mean, uh, we, we've used hammers for hundreds of years, but there's still something interesting to do with a hammer if you really think about what the hammer might be able to do and impart within a material and how you might, you might do that. Um, uh, Judy Pfaff, yeah, certainly, certainly there's some residue there from Judy Pfaff. Uh, do you feel the influence? Um, uh, somewhat in some of her drawings and some of her, her linear sculptures, uh, for sure. Um, I think, you know, early on, I didn't show a lot of influences, but Judy Pfaff would definitely be in that, that list. Uh, Eva Hesse would definitely be in that list. Um, um, uh, Martin Purrier, uh, Richard Deacon. Um, uh, but I've often looked at a lot of sort of painting and different aspects of painting from afar. Uh, and again, have not really just started to involve myself in, in this way of, uh, of uh, using color. Um, so this uh, question is, uh, 
Is it part of your goal when running things through 3D software to humanize software, computers, technology, uh, by overloading them with problems they can't fully solve? Well, I think I think at the at the end of the day, um, I don't I don't know that computers can ever really solve much. I mean, they're good at computation. Um, certainly, right now, the infancy of where we stand with with artificial intelligence will certainly change those things. But you know, there's a lot of bias that goes into these technologies, you know, the people that develop them, the people that put the coding into it, you know, they made the rules of how a command will act within within the software. And, and my job is not necessarily try to humanize it. It's just to try to exploit what they've already given me. Uh, so that's what I'm really trying to trying to involve in that work. Um, Color choices, are my color choices predetermined or is it intuitive? Completely intuitive. Uh, a lot of that is, again, this past year, uh, trying to challenge myself to use color uh, was to just kind of uh, dive in without any predetermined idea that what I was going to make was going to be rendered out and, and colored in the software. Um, it becomes about a blank canvas at that point. Uh, and then I'm, I'm with all these elements and these pieces, and then I just start spray painting and figure out how it goes. Um, is my wife an artist? Uh, no, um, she's she's a very good photographer, amazing historian, should probably be a historian, uh, but uh, she is the best studio assistant uh, I could ever hope for and puts up with an awful lot of time and effort helping me uh, with my work. Um, oh, I know this individual. Uh, have you seen the movie The Sound of Metal on Amazon Prime? Uh, I have not, and I will certainly, uh, uh, I will certainly check that out. I trust this individual to sort of push me into uh, specific ways that I need to, I need to expose myself. So, um, are there any other in the chats? Doesn't look like I see any questions in the chats and the Q&A looks like it, it finished up. So I think hopefully that's satisfactory to everybody. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for your talk this evening. And thanks to everyone who's joined us for the discussion. Uh, we will be mailing out a recording of the talk to everyone who registered. So in case you missed any of it, uh, you will be able to, to see the whole thing. Um, I hope you'll be able to visit the exhibition in person when the weather improves, um, when uh, we are not experiencing an ice storm. Uh, the gallery is normally open uh, Wednesdays through Sunday, uh, 12 to 5 p.m. and admission is always free. But during this uh, period of inclement weather, please do check uh, before venturing out uh, to make sure that uh, the gallery is open. As you're waiting for the snow to clear, uh, you might want to check out the craft kit for this exhibition, which will be available on our website next week. Uh, it will be a great opportunity to dust off your geometry skills and make a paper sculpture inspired by Jonathan's work. Next month, we will introduce uh, embroidery kits that are inspired by 108's 2021 exhibitions. And of course, the first one will feature uh, a work um, from Jonathan's exhibition. So watch uh, social media for more details about this new project. Also, if you're interested in purchasing one of Jonathan's sculptures, please visit our website at 108contemporary.org and use the drop down menu under shop to access our online shop. Um, and remember, uh, 108 members always receive a 10% discount on gallery sales. And if you're not yet a member of 108, you can join online. So thanks again for taking the time to join tonight's artist talk. And please be safe out there, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Take care, everybody.